Get the thumbs back in a while. Thank you. Thank you. I know that you're still with us. We got two more. Uh, next up. Antonio Mohammed is a local Red Seal pastry chef and entrepreneur, motivational public speaker at Edmonton with two platforms, one on being anti-racism, um, and the other one is a surprise. It's not on here, but we're going to find out. She was born in Calgary, and she relocated to Edmonton, and I'm going to give her the stage right now to let us know what's going on. Awesome. First of all, I just wanted to take a minute here to thank Jesse for inviting me to be a part of this panel and this discussion. It's hugely important not only for myself, but for everybody that's here to understand the gravity of this situation and what we're facing right now. Sadly, as somebody that was born and raised in Calgary, I've received or been a victim of a lot of racist acts in my life. And I'm here to talk about what are you supposed to do or what should you do or how are you supposed to feel when it comes from people that you're supposed to trust? It's ingrained in you that the first number you call when you're in trouble is 911. But what happens to you when you call 911 and the people that are there to help you or supposed to help you villainize you and victimize you and they say to you, how do we know you didn't set this up to recoup and get some money? I'll tell you my story here. My story is in May 5th, 2013, at 5 a.m., when I leave my townhouse and I go down to my car. I'm ready to go to work and start the day. I go to my car, and on the driver's side of my car, what do I see? Somebody's come along, and they've sketched the word nigger onto the side of my car. Nigger. Does that offend you? Coming from me? because everybody seems to be okay with it in all the top 40 radio stations. Everybody seems to be okay with it on all the YouTube channels. Everybody seems to be okay with it when it comes from a mainstream rapper or superstar. But when I say it, when I tell my story, everybody censors me. You can't say that word. That's gonna offend somebody. Fool, it offends me. I come down to my car, not only do I find the word nigger, but I find swastikas carved in to the hood of my car, to the trunk, to the two panels on the passenger side. I find the headlight smashed out. So I go back into my townhouse and I phone the police, 911. It's 5.30 a.m. They tell me they don't have anybody that's working the normal hours, that I have to wait until 8 a.m so that when somebody's in the precinct, they can send somebody out to take my report and have a look at my car. So because I'm in so much shock, I don't have anybody that I can turn to at this point. I'm dealing with this on my own. So I thank the person on the other line and I'm like, okay, I guess so. So what do I do after that? Well, I take some time to collect myself and I call the police back again and I get somebody else on the other line at the dispatch. Finally, this person says to me, well, yeah, it sounds like a crime's been committed. I'm gonna send somebody out right away. Well, thanks, that kind of made sense to me an hour ago when I called you at 5.30. But here we are at 6.30 and now somebody else is finally telling me, hey, guess what, a crime did occur. 10 minutes later, I have two officers at my door they're ready to take my story and they're ready to take pictures of my vehicle. When I ask if they can take fingerprints, they tell me they can't take fingerprints of my car because it's been raining, it's been compromised, because I've already been down there and I've touched the driver's side door and maybe they're, all they're gonna do is find my prints and what can they do in that case? So I said, okay, I guess that makes sense. So I'll tell you this, I'll, the long and the short of it is, their investigation was open for three days three days. We had a suspect because prior to this incident, I had some neighbors that lived next door where I had an incident with them where I had to phone the police to intervene because they were threatening my life. They were calling me a packy. 
They were telling me they were gonna climb over the balcony to kill me and come into my apartment. Yet again, the police get there, they don't issue an order of restraint, they don't do anything against those people. They tell me that instead of laughing at them for calling me a packy, that I should have just stayed quiet and stayed in my apartment mm -hmm. because maybe I escalated it. I don't know, maybe I did. I don't think I did, maybe I did in somebody's mind. So that was my first interaction with these neighbors. Two weeks after that first interaction, they were evicted from the townhouse complex. Two months after their eviction, my car was vandalized. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to put two and two together and figure out what's happened to my vehicle and who's done it. But within three days, Calgary police comes back to me. They've said, we've closed this investigation. Why? How, how do you, have you arrested somebody? Have you charged somebody? What's going on? No, they haven't done any of that. They're closing the investigation because there's no technical witnesses. Nobody's there to eyeball these people and point them out and say, those are the people that vandalized this woman's car. They don't have video in the complex. They don't have anything except for me saying, I think it was these people. Followed up with a police report from about a month ago now where these people were harassing me. No, the police turn to me and they say, we can't help you because no crime was committed. This is not a technical crime. So, I still to this day have not learned why hate crimes was never called out to investigate this, why it was never escalated, and what is it about this situation that is not necessarily a crime? Because since relocating to Edmonton, not only have I gone on to school, I got two scholarships while I was there. I've been the pastry chef to Beyonce's formation tour. I've gone on to do some great and some successful things. But even in all that time, in the seven years now that I've been in Edmonton, I've had the police trail me and pull me over three times. I've had neighbors call the police on me four times for the most ridiculous things. In one instance, one lady that was parking next to me at my apartment complex, somebody put a happy face in the snow on her windshield. She thought that was vandalism and mischief, so she phoned the police and said, whoa, this brown girl that parked next to me must have done this. What I can't entertain is the police thinking that that's even enough of an issue for them to come to my house, bang on my door at 10.30 at night, like I've just robbed a bank or I've killed somebody, just because some lady is ticked off that somebody put a happy face on the hood of her car in the snow. So, what do you do in these cases? These cases where people that are supposed to be protecting you are harassing you. In another instance, I had the police follow me into a shopper's drug mart. They came into the parking lot with their sirens blasting, with their lights blaring. I thought some like major criminal had come in and like, Something happened in one of the other stores in the shopping complex, but no, they were there for me. Little 5'4", all 98 pounds if I'm lucky, me. I'm a threat to Edmonton police? And what was my crime? Because I was driving down the Anthony Henday when it started snowing, and three quarters of my plate was covered. They thought that was enough of a reason to rip into the Shoppers Drug Mart parking lot like I was a criminal, not e follow me into the shopper's drug mart and harass me in front of all of the other shoppers, telling me I needed to put everything down and go back to my car to answer their questions, to prove that I had insurance, to prove that my plates were registered. Because there was snow on my plate? I'm sorry, I still to this day don't understand. But that doesn't mean that I'm gonna give up. No, that just inspires me to do more to do more of these events, to speak more, to educate people. And when people say, what can we do? How can we help you? Well, you know what? Pick up your goddamn phone. I don't call you a lot, but when I do call you, you better fucking know it's urgent and that I need your back. Because how many times have I called people that have said they're gonna be there that aren't? 
So if you truly want to help, you want to be a part of the solution, be there. That's number one. Number two, do not ever minimize our experiences and do not ever minimize racism. Because how many times do I get to hear, oh, at least you're lucky you're in Canada. It's not that bad. Fuck you, it's not that bad. It's fucking horrible. My first racist experience was at four years old. Four. Should any four-year-old know what a nigger or a packy or a chink is or even know those words? No. But that's the Alberta I grew up in. That's Calgary. And sadly, that's Edmonton. And there are very, very few people that have done anything to change my mind. And I suppose that's part of my challenge and part of the reason I'm here tonight is to challenge not only my fellow speakers and everybody else that's here, to challenge the people that are watching, the people that really want to help support and see change, to follow through, to do that, and to be there. I'm gonna close this with one final thought in that I attended a virtual funeral this morning for a little girl that was taken away way too soon in one of the most tragic ways possible. And at the end of that funeral, her mom was speaking about grief. And how do you help somebody that's going through grief? Because a lot of people just want to step up and they just want to insert opinions and their stories and how they think you should feel and how they think you should be handling it. But the best thing that she said, when somebody's handling grief or when somebody's experiencing something, how can you help them? You close your mouth, you open your ears, you open your heart, and you open your mind. And that's all you can do. And then you lend your support. 110% you give that support wholeheartedly. Believe it or not, some of that support might even be physical. Somebody like me that goes out to some of these events, I might need somebody to come with me that makes me feel safe. And how many times have I called somebody and again, they haven't picked up? So that's my biggest challenge, is if you are really going to help and you really want to be a part of the solution and try to fix this, step up and do just that. Thank you.